Everybody, welcome to another episode of Fruitless Pursuits. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, we started a series a year or two ago, and it's been kind of slow rollout. But we do it because of our love for like the behind the scenes stuff. And, Absolutely. Um, so what we have been doing is focusing on producers, the producers behind you know these records that we love. And uh, of course, we did a two part one about. Terry Date, uh, we talked about Brendan O'Brien, we have several others in the queue, but the one that had to be done next was none other than Evil Joe Barisi. Yeah, it seemed like a, you know, we were, we talk about production and, and uh, it's a part of that, um, and, and it, a lot of this stemmed for us from that. Rick Rubin kind of um, disease that goes around the production world, right? You know, like, what do these people do? What, what are they when they're at their best? Where are they when they're at their worst? Um, and, you know, when you start just loving music, you find yourself holding that sleeve and reading those names and then thinking, like, what, you know, how have these people affected the fabric of this thing that I love, this piece of art that I love? And, sure. so, you know, slowly we learn that there's kind of this, like, the people who do it best, like, know when to add something and then they know when to just shut up and, and sit behind the desk. Right. And yeah. I, I think that that's something that, um, uh, Joe does so well. And one of the reasons that he was like a, you know, an obvious pick, but also someone we wanted to get to quickly. Yeah. I think that's probably a, a through line with the producers so far that we've chosen to kind of highlight. Um, if you had to pick one thing that unifies all of them, it's that idea that, um, Yes, there's a, a, a artistic contribution, um, but there's also a sense of like capturing what's going on in the studio with that particular artist in that particular time frame. Absolutely. And so you get those classic records. Um, if somebody was not familiar with the name Joe Barisi, what record would you hand them and be like, here, this is, this is your starting point. That's so, that's so interesting because, you know, there were, there are records that, um, kind of in doing research that I realized he produced that are some of my favorites, you know, of like that bands or whatever. So yeah. that's a really interesting thing. And I think what's interesting is that like, you don't, it's not like Rich Robinson or, or some, excuse me, like it's not like someone who like has this sound that drapes over it, you know, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, we think about, other producers through the years that have this, like, you know, there's like the wall of sound. There's these ideas of what that producer brings to your um, yeah. thing that you're going to do. And and he doesn't really have that. I mean, I think I would go to something that, like, um, the Queens of the Stone Age self-titled record, because 100%. it's like, it's Sound City. You know, it's it's kind of just the fabric of who he is. And, and I think yeah. it's what, it's a record that bands listen to and, and go, let's work with that guy. Yeah. So, um, which for me, apparently the backstory on that record it came came about very, very organically. You know, uh, Joe Barisi also worked on those um, the Caius records yep. with with Chris Goss is is the um, is the producer, and I think so. Joe would have engineered. I'm not sure whether he mastered them or not, but again, we're talking about a guy that does everything, yeah. soup to nuts. He you know produces, he engineers, he. Uh, he does, you know, the mixing, um, and he will take on various aspects depending on, you know, what needs to be done, which I think is, is a pretty cool testament to the guy that he's just like, wants to serve whatever the project is and whatever way he can. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, I think just to, to, uh, to testify a little bit to what you're saying about his kind of bona fides, you know, for his, the job that he holds, right? If you follow him on Instagram, it is just like a dump of gear. Like, yeah. it's just like shot after shot, like to the point where it's like, uh, okay. But there's people, drool I, I know that on the other end of this somewhere, there's people drooling over this, right? And and yeah. it's also something that artists talk about when they talk about him. They go, oh, and then he brought this thing and 
that tone became the the centerpiece of how we created this record or what have you. Right. Yeah. There's some there's some great anecdotes all around. Uh, we definitely talk about the the Queen self title, but uh, to that point, there is an anecdote about him recording with Soundgarden, and Chris Cornell says, "I need something to." I need something to do this. Hmm. And Joe brings him a pedal that he built. He's like, yeah, this is it. This sounds great. He's <laughs> like, I need, I need this. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to fucking build you one because it's not, yeah, know, this is the only this one, is not yeah, yeah. something that I bought at guitar center, you know? Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of stories like that where <clears throat> he's just a, you know, DIY guy at heart and, um, a gearhead and all that stuff. So he's like, you know, and a musician. So, yeah. Um, I think people really like working with them, but to jump back to, you know, your pick for the kind of quintessential mm -hmm. Joe Barisi record, and there's lots for sure, but you picked the same one that I would have picked because I think you're right. That self-titled Queens record is just like uh, a, a perfect snapshot of like what, you know, what he kind of does. Absolutely. And they knew him from the Caius days Josh was working with uh, Screaming Trees, right? In Seattle, that's right. Or Screaming Trees. He's got these songs kicking around uh, that he's demoed. He can't get anybody to bite on them. Nobody's interested. And he calls up Joe Barisi. Joe Barisi goes, yeah, shoot me, shoot me some songs. Let's hear you know, what you're working on. And he turns it on, and Mexicola plays. And he's like, fuck, dude, this is... You know, this is amazing. Yeah. Let's just do it. We don't need a label. Let's just go record it. So they go in. They record those songs. Uh, as, you know, a lot of Queens fans know, uh, Josh played all the bass parts on there. Yeah. Did everything but the drums, essentially, right? Um, they spent some time experimenting with, you know, different tones and uh, vocal techniques and you know, ambient room noise and all that kind of stuff, which you can really hear on that record, which kind of, it just gives it that stamp of authenticity in a certain way. Yeah, no, I think it's it's one of those records that you put on, it, if, you've, if you're hearing it for the first time, you go, where has this been all my life? What, like, it's, it's so amazing, and it, it jumps out at you for for the way it sounds. You know, there, uh, obviously the music is, is great, it's catchy, it's... Uh, drives hard, but like has these, you know, that the balance that we've come to know and 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 expect from Queens of the Stone Age. That's like this hard driving, um, but emotional tonality, like uh, actual singing, right? You know, things that that really make it um, a great record and great songs. But it it is it proves that you could have all that stuff and then it not be there because you don't have the right person capturing it, right? Filtering through the thing, yeah. and I think that um you know uh josh and he's you know said as much that you know he knew he needed someone that that could help him get from a to z with it you know um mm -hmm. being such a, uh, a controlled uh and any artist like this they're gonna be con they really want to control what the outcome is but you have to know what you can do and what you can i think he at the time you know they've come to start producing their own records but at the time he, he needed people that were gonna um you know really help him get the, the what he could hear onto the record yeah for sure and I think that's we see that a lot where somebody that's engineered records, you know, builds a rapport with the people because, you know, in a big studio environment, you know, if you're working for, say, a Rick Rubin as an engineer, <laughs> you're having a lot more interface with the artist. You're doing the job. Than, that's than right. he is in, in most aspects. So, right. like, when he's sleeping on the couch and you're setting mic placements and going, how does that sound? Okay, I think it sounds better here. All of a sudden, you have input on these records. So, you know, that's why you see a lot of these guys go from engineering into producing because they built these rapport with the artist. <clears throat> and I think that's a good a good uh, case of that. Now, yeah. uh, Chris Goss continued to, you know, work with, with Josh in the Desert Session stuff and, um, you know, do a lot of other stuff that's Absolutely. kind of peripherally related, right? Yeah, there's that Masters but, uh, of Reality album that you know basically means the stage to go on to and, and just become the band for it yeah um, but yeah so so there's that there's still that cool like you know palm desert tie-in absolutely um and they never that never goes away but 
you know, Barisi comes their, becomes their guy for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, um, it's, and not just that. I think that that Queens record is like, if you look at the catalog chronologically, it's the linchpin that then throws it into, you know, high gear that gets you that gets you to like the uh, Melvin's record that gets you to Jesus Lizard, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and you know the other thing that's so cool about you know we can point out the records we don't like, you know, in his catalog um, because anybody's going to find them. Right. But then there's like these great punk records, you know, like Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that, you know, he, he has a nose for some great stuff. And I mean, one of the surprises to me as I was doing this research is my favorite Tomahawk record, Mitt Gass, he, 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 he um, produced. And in hindsight, I'm like, of course he did. You know, like yeah. the way it sounds, it's, not, it's, it's clean, it doesn't have a lot of the um, kind of hiccups. I bet he had to like corral Mike Patton occasionally, but there's some, there's just great stuff on it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, his, his kind of discography is full of that. Um, and I think most of the records are going to be people going to him. Uh, but like, uh, you know, when he worked with Tool, one of the things I learned uh, is that um, he kind of heard that they were recording you know, and um, apparently um, Buzz Osborne kind of, you know, made mention to Adam Jones, hey, you should, you know, check out Joe Barisi. But mm-hmm. he also apparently, um, according to Joe, uh, had his manager get in touch with the band, too, because he's like, I think I can be of service here. I think I can add something to what they're doing. Um, yeah. And so if they're recording, I'd love to be a part of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. And, you know, look, I'm that's kind of post where I follow Tool, too. Uh-huh. Um, Which is a mistake on your part, but that's fine. <clears throat> what you think? Ten thousand days is a. I think it's a great record. I don't think it's. Yeah. I mean, because I, see, like, okay, this is gonna, let's this is, let's not get too sidetracked. <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. But. Yeah, let's not let's not protract it. But I think it's a good record. Um, did it need to wait ten years to be put out or whatever it was? Seven years? No. But like, I think it's a good record. My okay. favorite songs are not on it, but that's fine. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so there, there's. There's all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The tool, the 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 self titled Tomahawk record as well as Mick Gas, which yeah. I think is is a pretty you know, says a lot on its own. It's a good record, sure. Um you know, a lot of that experimentation with the the vocal, um mm-hmm. the respirator Re- mic yeah, yeah, that sure. Mike Patton uses on that. That's all uh that's all birthed from experimenting yeah in the studio which is you know what what joe barisi is kind of known for so that's cool um you know he's worked with monster magnet he's worked with clutch he's worked with you know fu manchu the melvins jesus lizard like just all these fucking great bands that sure. you know there's a there's an interview that he had with dean del rey which is a really good listen if you're if you're interested uh in that you know, when Dean Del Rey is introducing him, he's like, your resume is my CD collection. And that really, that really resonates with me. Cause that's kind of, that encompasses my thoughts about him. I'm like, God damn, this guy has fucking worked on everything. Yeah. And, uh, especially some weird, some oddball stuff that I had no idea about. Like the, um, one of the last ISIS records before they broke up, totally. Wavering Radiant, he produced that. Um, he produced Sick of It All, Built to Last, which is like their, uh, I think their second major label release. Right. So, and his catalog is just scattered with stuff like that. Yes, there's um, Chevelle and <laughs> some of these <laughs> other bands that like, you know, maybe are not in your or my wheelhouse. Right. But he obviously sees something in those bands because he's been pretty clear that he really you know, for him to pick up a project at this point, he has to be into the music and yeah. has to like what's being created. Yeah, he's obviously someone who uh, is engaged by the process. You know, he's he, like, I hate to keep picking on this guy, but he's not, you know, sitting, he's not Rick Rubin. He's not sitting on the couch translating Buddha platitudes into the music business. You know what I mean? He's not, he's he's there engaged in the process because he loves it so much. Not just, he like ma- likes making music. He likes documenting it, you know? Um, he likes um, plugging A into B and seeing how that changes when you, when you add this other thing to it. Um, and that, 
it shows, you know, he's engaged mm-hmm. in the process. And, you know, I think that that's the part that makes him such an asset, right? In the, in the, yeah. in the studio, especially cause you know, um, anyone who has a, like a core group of friends that hangs out with the same four, excuse me, the same four or five people or whatever, um, you know, weird tension develops, bullshit develops, but then you have someone that comes in that's like, like fresh to the, to the, to the process, fresh to the group. Right. And they bring in this energy and this love of making that then translates to everybody else. And I think that that makes him such an asset and, and it's what brings what it's what validates, you know, his name on the, on the, on the liner notes. And, yeah. and one of the cool things to me, I think I said this to you before, but <clears throat> he strikes me as the, the person who actually is who Steve Albini is trying to be, you know, mm. Steve Albini like throws this um, blue collar working man's producer at you all the time. And I think that it's really becomes more of his, like his punk, like, you know, like jacket check or something. Um, whereas Joe Bracey doesn't say that he just does it right. He just is yeah. the guy who shows up and does the thing. And I mean, I think that that makes him all the more valuable, right? That he, he's not tr- trying to interject his personality into it as well. Yeah. Uh, One of the things about him that I noticed in all of these interviews that I've listened to, um, and there's a lot of them, he is not, um, he's not like a mysterious figure. Right. He, he's all over the place. And what I love about him, first of all, he seems like just a fucking top notch dude. Right. Like when you hear him talk, he is like any other dude. He's not talking in these you know, this weird coded language or like you said, the, you know, the Buddhist platitudes. And, <laughs> um, he's a regular dude and um, there's no like secret sauce. Yeah. He's like, uh, you know, get in there and experiment, play yeah. around, see what sounds good. It doesn't have to just be, you know, if you're recording guitars, it's not always putting a fucking sure 57 on a, celestian v30 right like play around move the mics you know use different stuff like and his love of gear shows because like you said his instagram is just full of like yeah you know random preamps and um and he is not shy about saying you know a lot of people are very protective about the process and whatever but he does not seem to be shy about saying yeah i use this particular you know board or this particular preamp or piece of equipment on this part of this record and um so I think there was one thing that he said, you know, I got one little secret secret yeah, piece of gear that exactly. uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep to myself, but, um, well, I think, but that, it's, that... it's funny because, you know, Josh Homme was, was that way for a long time where he, you know, he was very protective about what gear he used on those yeah. records. Yeah. You weren't going to get a catch. You weren't going to catch a picker, picture of his pedal board or anything like that. Um, and, and I think a lot of artists, are for for you know a number of reasons it's like i think you always get a little insecure about the fact that you look around and you see a lot of talent everywhere and if you've like lucked into this like combination of things you know like you the last thing you want to do is like just say oh it's just time with a little bit of rosemary you know like yeah um you know um of course we all know that it doesn't it's not that easy sure ev- put, everybody puts time with rosemary all the time and it doesn't taste like this so i mean um you know it, it translates differently. And I think, honestly, he's so secure in himself. That's what you really get from that. That's what that tells me. Is that he's yeah. just so secure in himself and what he can do that he's like, oh, here, I'll give you all this stuff. You know, yeah. try making it. I mean, have fun. Um, because it, it's, it's, those, it's that 10,000 hours of experimenting with those things that really produces right. the magic, right? And, um, you know, I think that you're absolutely nail on the head with it. And, I, and it is what keeps all these great bands coming back to him. I mean, the one of the things we haven't mentioned is, and I didn't know this until I started this research, is that apparently he's, um, the production of the New Baroness is, is Joe Barisi, right? So we have, oh, a wow. fourth, we have a forthcoming record that's that's got this good stuff on it. I'm sure there'll be like something in the comments. Actually, he just engineered it or whatever. But, but then, yeah. you know, this, and this is what, what But I he's read, involved so. somehow. He's yeah. involved somehow, right? So Which I think. Which is even more a reason to get excited about exactly, the new record. For exa- yeah. Exactly. And, and I think it, it you know, we're looking at a band that we're sure, and we've discussed this on the show before that is sure to be putting forth some sort of transition on us. You know, we're we're sure to see some sort of change. Um, just, just some of the, um, of what we've heard and what we've seen aesthetically seems to point to that. And what, what better, 
producer to bring in and feel comfortable changing than you know with Joe Barisi. So I think that I think that's 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 a really great kind of uh, you know thing to come out of this. And honestly, if you look at there's a there's in his catalog there's there's kind of a blank space there. Nothing has happened really recently that that yeah. um, you know is his guy's name on. So it would be cool to to hear that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This time, Can you think of any other uh, Evil Joe anecdotes? That I, I just think that, like, I mean, going through the research, the things that, like, you know, jumped out were, you know, one of the things that I want to add is the fact that he's not like he loves, like, and this is from quotes from him. You know, he loves um, analog and he thinks it's cool, but he's like, but you know. Um, Technology is great. I love using this stuff, but it's not the answer. You know, yeah. it's not, it's, you know, you can do all these things, play magic with all this stuff, or you just do the thing. Um, yeah. I, it also seems that he's one of those producers that, that likes to do, you know, he's not like the kind of guy who's going to record just the, the snare drum and then come along and just the hi hat. And, you know, he doesn't isolate those things. He likes live in a room. He likes what yeah. the, the things that happen with the band. And to me, you know, that's, I mean, that's what I would want. You know, I want, yeah. I'd want i want that, that, that lightning in a bottle thing going on. And that's where always, to me, the best things have happened um, in art that I've been a part of that involved a group, right? You know, when, when it's like everybody kind of reacting to the same thing at the same time. Right. Um, you know, yeah, I, but you're right. He's not afraid to use all of the tools that are available. Exactly. And not just be, I'm going to be, again, I, I love Steve Albini. And I'm not picking on him here, but like, you know, he has this intentional kind of Luddite yeah. um, persona that he totally. puts on. Like, I'm strictly analog, right? Um, Barisi's not like that. He yeah. likes analog. He likes everything. Yeah. They're all tools. They yeah. all have a, a, a different time and place to use them. Exactly. And I think, that's, I think that's really cool, especially for a guy that's a little bit older, been in the business a long time, to adapt and adopt these newer technologies and use them in, in certain ways where they're, where they're useful, I think is, is again, it's like just a, another testament to how uh, engaged and like just down for the process he seems to be. Totally. Totally. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I saw this um, Herbie Hancock um, uh, movie the other day. And one of the things he was talking about was this time he was playing with, you know, this like stacked deck of musicians, right? Miles, he's in the Miles Davis band yeah. and he plays like a chord wrong. And he said, he literally like kind of threw up his hands like, oh my, like, God, what did I just do? I mean, and Miles was in the middle of some solo or something. And then Miles Davis paused and then played notes that made the chord he played right. Yeah. Um, and one of the things he was saying is like how much that taught him about music and making things, um, but also life, you know, and that we really have to go with the situation we're presented with and i think the it's those times in making art that you're most uh, alive but also you can't do that if you're so um pre-registered to everything that it has to be this way uh and it strikes me that that you know though everything sounds really amazing everything's processed in this amazing way that joe barisi is one of those producers that likes the scrapes and bumps um, you know, and, and, and they, t t you know, tends to keep those kind of things in, in the, in the process. Yeah. I think that's a great place to leave it. That totally sums it up, man. Yeah, happy to uh, do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank y'all for joining us. We do appreciate it. Leave a comment or a like, or any of that stuff. Let us Please. know what is your favorite Joe Barisi record Absolutely. or the one that you would give to somebody who is unfamiliar and say, Hey, this is the, this is your intro. Check it out. I love it. All right, until next time. Take it easy, guys.